Good afternoon. I'm Adele Shabelsky, and on behalf of the Ojai Retreat, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon of Poetry is Passion, and to introduce you to David Moody, my good friend. Um, enjoy. Thank you all for coming out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon for an occasion of poetry. Um, we're just going to jump right into it, okay? I'll first uh, read a few things that uh, some poets have said about poetry. I want to try to demonstrate why I think poetry is passion. William Wordsworth said, Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Randall Jarrell said, a good poet is someone who manages, I should rephrase that, a good poet <laughs> is someone who manages in a lifetime of standing out in thunderstorms to be struck by lightning five or six times, a dozen or two dozen times, and he is great. <laughs> Emily Dickinson said, if I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. Robert Frost said, there are three things, after all, that a poem must reach, the eye, the ear, and what we may call the heart or the mind. It is most important of all to reach the heart of the reader. Bob Dylan said, I consider myself a poet first and a musician second. I live like a poet and I'll die like a poet. Stephen Spender said, Great poetry is always written by somebody straining to go beyond what he can do. Robert Graves said, I believe that every English poet should read the English classics, master the rules of grammar before he attempts to bend or break them, travel abroad, experience the horrors of sordid passion, and, if he is lucky enough, know the love of an honest woman. He also said, there's no money in poetry, <laughs> but then there's no poetry in money either. <laughs> I was going to keep my coat on in honor of our first poet, but it's a little too warm in here for that. So that's a little warm-up as to why I think that poetry is passion, but to really get the full idea, you have to hear a poem about poetry. And I just happen to have one. <laughs> it's written by Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens was born in Pennsylvania in 1899. He went to Harvard and then to New York Law School and settled into a career as an executive with the Hartford Insurance Company in Connecticut. Eventually, he became vice president of Hartford, a position he held for many years. Stevens did not feel there was any contradiction between his day job and his career as a poet. He felt that a regular job developed character, both as a man and as a poet. But his life was really dominated by poetry. He used to walk to work, and as he walked, People would see him stop and sometimes back up a few steps and then continue on. This is because he was working up the meter to a new poem, and he measured out the meter in his steps as he walked. Stevens once wrote, after one has abandoned a belief in God, poetry is that essence which takes its place as life's redemption. Stevens' volumes of poetry won the National Book Award in 1951 and 1954, and the Pulitzer Prize in the year of his death, 1955. One of Stephen's favorite themes was poetry itself. In the poem I'm going to read, which is called The Idea of Order at Key West, he uses the contrast between the sounds of the ocean and a woman's song 
to explore the nature of the poetic act. Uh, Key West is a small island with a harbor off the coast of southern Florida, and the poet is recalling a walk he took there with a friend, uh, Ramon Fernandez, when they observed a woman uh, walking along the beach and singing to herself. So the coat and tie are in honor of Wallace Stevens because that's what he wore to work every day, and also his poems are kind of dressed up in a coat and tie, so <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> This is the idea of order at Key West. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. The water never formed to mind or voice like a body, a holy body, fluttering its empty sleeves. And yet its mimic motion a uh, made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours, although we understood, inhuman of the veritable ocean. And the sea was not a mask, no more was she. The song and water were not medleyed sound, even if what she sang was what she heard for what she sang was uttered word by word. It may be that in all her phrases stirred the grinding water and the gasping wind, but it was she and not the sea we heard. For she was the maker of the song she sang, the ever-hooded, tragic, gestured sea and was merely a place by which she walked to sing. Whose spirit is this, we said, because we knew it was the spirit that we sought, and knew that we should ask this often, as she sang. If it was only the dark voice of the sea that rose, or even colored by many waves, if it was only the outer voice of sky and cloud, of the sunken coral, water walled, however clear, it would have been deep air, the heaving speech of air, a summer sound repeated in a summer without end and sound alone. But it was more than that, more even than her voice and ours among the meaningless plungings of water and the wind theatrical distances, bronze shadows heaped on high horizons, mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. It was her voice that made the sky acutest at its vanishing. As she measured to the hour its solitude. She was the single artificer of the world in which she sang. And when she sang, the sea whatever self it had, became the self that was her song, for she was the maker. Then we, as we beheld her striding there alone, knew that there never was a world for her except the one she sang, and singing made. Ramon Fernandez, tell me, if you know. Why, uh, when the singing ended and we turned toward the town, tell why the, the glassy lights, the lights in the fishing boats at anchor there, as the night descended, a tilting in the air, mastered the night and portioned out the sea, fixing emblazoned zones and fiery poles, arranging, deepening, enchanting night. Oh, blessed rage for order, pale Ramon, the maker's rage to order words of the sea, the words of uh, 
in the fragrant portals dimly starred, and of ourselves, and of our origins, in ghostlier demarcations, keener sounds. So, I don't need my tie anymore for the next few poems. <laughs> and so I'm going to take a little break. And um, in the meantime, I want you to know that um, Bob Ryman was born in Houston, Texas, and he began playing violin when he was eight years old. He's highly skilled in all forms and modes of violin music, from country to classics, from bluegrass to Broadway. He's currently a member of both the Moore Park Symphony Orchestra as well as the Topanga Symphony Orchestra. And he's not only a virtuoso performer, but also a teacher, as well as a gifted uh, composer and songwriter. Uh, please welcome Mr. Robert Ryman. Well, thank you. Then, from country to classics, from bluegrass to Broadway, people ask, what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? Well, I say a violinist plays at Carnegie Hall, but a fiddler plays on, on the, the roof. roof. William Blake was born in London in 1757 and died at the age of 69 in 1827. He was almost as gifted as a painter and a printmaker as he was as a poet. Uh, he was considered rather mad by his contemporaries due to his radical religious views and his tendency to see visions. William Wordsworth said of him, there was no doubt that this poor man was mad but there is something in the madness of this man which interests me more than the sanity of Lord Byron or Walter Scott. <laughs> Blake's importance as an artist and a poet only came to be appreciated in the latter half of the 19th century, and one important critic said he was the romantic writer who has exerted the most powerful influence on the 20th century. In 2002, the BBC uh, conducted a poll to determine the 100 greatest Britons of all time, and Blake came in at number 38. Blake was strongly influenced by the Bible from an early age, although he much preferred the New Testament to the Old Testament. Uh, he was deeply opposed to organized religion, but he held strong religious views of his own. He said of Jesus, for example, he is the only God, and so am I, and so are you. Uh, his views of organized religion, on the other hand, are apparent in this poem entitled The Garden of Love.
I went to the garden of love, and I saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. And so I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black Gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. However, as I say, uh, Blake, Blake had strong religious understanding and impulses of his own, and you might see those manifest in this poem, which is called The Tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what a shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? Uh, what the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? And when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? And finally, from Blake, since we're here in Ojai, and some of you may be a little bit familiar with the philosophy of uh, Krishnamurti, here's a very little poem which expresses one of Krishnamurti's views in language that Krishnamurti would never use, but uh, expresses it maybe even better. <laughs> <laughs> he who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Emily Dickinson was born in 1830 in Amherst, Massachusetts, where she lived all her life until she died at the age of 56. She produced in all over 1,800 poems, but fewer than a dozen of these were published during her lifetime. Dickinson was rather eccentric, and especially after the age of 30, she rarely left her parents' home. She was much involved with household chores, however, including a great skill and fascination with gardening, as well as good facility with baking. Uh, but most of her significant relationships were carried on by means of correspondence. It was only after her death that her sister, Lavinia, discovered how prolific Dickinson was as a poet. Lavinia was determined to get Emily's work into print, but Dickinson wrote in an unusual style with no real punctuation other than the frequent use of dashes and irregular capitalization of words and uh, frequent use of what is called slant rhyme, uh, uh, such as rhyming pearl with alcohol. <laughs> So the first published uh, books of her work often corrected her punctuation as well as some of her wording. It was not until 1955 that an accurate edition of Dickens's complete poems was finally published, and today she is considered unquestionably one of the most important uh, American poets. 
Now, Dickinson's uh, poems are short, and they're very compact, and they're very clever, and they're a little bit astonishing, and it's kind of hard to catch it the first time. So I have three of her poems that I'm going to read. They don't have titles. Uh, she didn't title her poems, so they just have numbers according to what is suspected to be the order in which they were written. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, I'm going to read three of her poems without the titles, because they don't have titles. But then I'm going to read them again, because I don't think you can quite get it the first time around. Maybe you can, but maybe you can't, so I can double check by reading twice. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. A success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As a lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves uh, and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste. And I had put away my labor uh, and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible. The cornice in the ground. Since then, Tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will contain, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, as syllable from sound. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a, a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Uh, since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first 
surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue. Uh, the one the other will absorb, as a sponge's buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. Uh, William Butler Yeats was an Irish poet who lived from 1865 until 1939. He was very well known during his lifetime, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923 at the age of 58. Some critics considered that his best work was produced even after he won the Nobel Prize. Yeats was influenced by William Blake as well as by the Theosophical Society. He was fascinated by magic and by the occult, and these also formed sources for his poetry. Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, was written in 1920 and is generally considered one of the most important poems of the 20th century. In the opening line, the word gyre, G-Y-R-E, means a spiral shape, uh, a word related to a gyrate and gyroscope. This word refers not only to the flight pattern of a falcon, but also to Yeats's uh, vision of the cycle of history, which he perceives as occurring in 2,000 years intervals. Uh, in this poem, the phrase a spiritus mundi uh, can be translated roughly as the spirit of the world, or the soul of the world. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. The things uh, fall apart, and the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best uh, lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Uh, surely, uh, the second coming is at hand. <clears throat> the second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Uh, somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body in the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all around it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. And the darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast his hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Now, for a little change of mood, <laughs> um, here's another poem by Blake. The particular cat in this poem is named Minalush, M-I-N-N-A-L-O-U-S-H-E. It has no special meaning, it's just the name of a, a, a cat owned by a friend of Yeats, but it, somehow it fits in this poem. The cat went here and there, and the moon spun round like a top. 
and the nearest kin of the moon, the creeping cat, looked up. Black Minelush stared at the moon, for wander and wail as he would, the clear cold light in the sky troubled his animal blood. Minelush runs in the grass, lifting his delicate feet. Do you dance, Minelush? Do you dance? When two close kindred meet, oh, what better than call a dance? Maybe the moon may learn, tired of that courtly fashion, a new dance turn. Minelush creeps through the grass from moonlit place to place. The sacred moon overhead has taken a new phase. Does Minelush know that his pupils will pass from change to change, and that from round to crescent, from crescent to round they range? Minelush creeps through the grass, alone, important, and wise, and lifts to the changing moon his changing eyes. <laughs> when I was in my early teens, or even younger, sometimes I would look at books of poetry and every so often, I would run across a poem whose author was given as anonymous. And I always used to think, I wonder who that guy is whose name is anonymous. <laughs> Later on, when I learned what that word meant, I wondered why there would ever be a poem written by somebody who did not want his or her uh, name attached to it. I have since learned there might be various reasons for this to occur, but in any case, I thought it might be appropriate today to include one poem written by Anonymous. This uh, particular little poem happens to have been written in Ojai, of all places. I had that on good authority. <laughs> and it was composed in October 2008. It is called Coyote Country. This poem is what might be called uh, naturalistic. That is, it's merely a snapshot of nature, a poem whose meaning is entirely on the surface without any deeper significance. Coyote Country. Yippers and yappers are out tonight, pressing their case, lighting up the night with coyote dialogue. The lonely moon sends long shadows through the grasses and the brush, down the gullies, up the sides of empty barns. The eyes of the cat grow round and bright. The raccoons frolic, the owls watch. But the night belongs to the canine tribe, laughing and scolding in cascades of golden sound. This is coyote country.
Edgar Allan Poe was born in 1809, and he died in 1849 at the age of 40. His birth parents were a well-known actor and actress, but his father abandoned the family uh, the year after Poe was born, and his mother died a year later from tuberculosis. Poe was adopted by a wealthy family in Richmond, Virginia, but his relationship with his adoptive parents was never very successful. Poe is considered the first American writer who tried to earn a living through writing alone, but he's, the results were not encouraging. He is regarded as the inventor of the genre of detective fiction. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, said each of Poe's detective stories is a root from which a whole literature has developed. Where was the detective story until Poe breathed life into it? Today there is an annual award given by the Mystery Writers of America called, after Poe, the Edgar Awards. When Poe was 26 years old, he married his cousin, Virginia Clem, who at the time of their marriage was 13 years old, although her age on the marriage certificate was listed as 21. They were married for 12 years until she died of tuberculosis. In 1845, Poe achieved uh, a great deal of celebrity with the publication of his poem, The Raven. He was paid $9 for it. Uh, the poem had mixed success among critics, but Abraham Lincoln admired it sufficiently to memorize it in its entirety. Only 12 copies of uh, Poe's first book of poems, only 12 copies remain of Poe's first book of poems, and one of those copies was sold at auction at Christie's in New York in 2009. Uh, the price paid for that single copy was $662,500, which is the largest amount ever paid for a work of American literature. Some of the language in The Raven is a little bit unfamiliar to a contemporary audience, so it might be helpful to explain some of the vocabulary. One of the figures in the poem is the Greek goddess of wisdom, Pallas Athena. Uh, the narrator in the poem has a bust that is a sculpture of the head of Pallas Athena situated above the door of his room. He refers to it just as Pallas, but we're expected to know it as Pallas Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. Uh, Pluto in uh, Roman mythology is the god of the underworld that is Hades, or hell, and the Plutonian shore is the entrance to the underworld. A nepenthe is a drug, it's made mention of in the Odyssey, uh, that is supposed to induce forgetfulness. Uh, some of you may know there's a famous uh, restaurant in Big Sur called Nepenthe. Uh, Aden, spelled A-I-D-E-N-N, -N, is just an archaic form of the word Eden, uh, which in this poem is somewhat equivalent to the concept of heaven. A seraphim are a type of angel. A mean, spelled M-I-E-N, refers to someone's posture, or how they carry themselves. A dirge is a slow, mournful song, uh, usually a lament for someone who has died. A quaff means to drink some liquid. A quoth means to say something, to speak. A censer, C-E-N-S-E-R, is a device for distributing incense. Obeisance is a gesture of respect. It means a deep bow. And just a little word about um, the species raven. It's related to a, um, it's related to a crow. Uh, but a raven is, is uh, quite a bit bigger than a crow. It can grow to a length of uh, 27 inches. That's 27 inches from the tip of its beak to the end of its tail, and it can have a wingspan up to four feet. And it is the case that uh, ravens are 
uh, capable of speech, uh, somewhat like a parrot. Uh, once upon a midnight, dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Uh, Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Uh, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, or filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, uh, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Uh, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Uh, this it is, and nothing more." Uh, presently my soul grew stronger, uh, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, uh, "'or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door, uh, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, Fearing, doubting, uh, dreaming uh, dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Uh, soon again I heard a tapping, uh, somewhat louder than before. Uh, surely, said I, surely that is uh, something at my window lattice. Uh, let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Uh, Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, a perched above my chamber door, a perched upon the bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Uh, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this 
ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, uh, though its answer a uh, little meaning, little relevancy bore. Uh, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, a bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, a doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, a caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore of never nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, a straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, uh, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushions a uh, velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press oh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew a denser, a perfumed from an unseen censer a swung by a seraphim whose footsteps tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, uh, by these angels he hath sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a saintly maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart. And take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul, 
from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Time and take me out to the 
Uh, Ernest Lawrence Thayer was born in Massachusetts in 1863. He studied philosophy at Harvard College, or he graduated magna cum laude. While at Harvard, uh, Thayer served as editor of uh, the Lampoon, the Harvard uh, humor magazine, and he became good friends with a classmate, uh, William Randolph Hearst. After they graduated, uh, Hearst invited Thayer to come to work as a humor columnist for the San Francisco Examiner. Thayer accepted the offer, and he worked at the Examiner for two years. The last piece he published there when he was 24 years old was called Casey at the Bat. Uh, this poem made him famous, both as a sports poem and for its humor. But Thayer never again published anything of comparable interest. When he was 49 years old, uh, Thayer retired from his family's mill business, and he moved to Santa Barbara. He died there in 1940 at the age of 77. Uh, just want to comment briefly about the opening line. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. So if some of you who might not be familiar with baseball, Mudville Nine, if it's in a baseball context, that's a shorthand way of referring to the team. A baseball team has nine players, so the Mudville Nine is the baseball team associated with Mudville. And you might ask uh, why um, a long poem about baseball would be uh, placed in a town called Mudville. <laughs> <laughs> but the poem is, is very ironic and it, you know, it suggests a town which is kind of down on its luck and kind of suggests why they might be so passionate and invested in the success of their baseball team. It was probably the only good thing they have going for them. Okay. And uh, also, uh, I just can't resist pointing out, it, when it says, the outlook wasn't brilliant, that, that's an understatement. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an example of the irony that, that runs uh, throughout the poem. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, this poem was written in 1888, so, you know, baseball was not that well established at the time, but well enough. And um, the subtitle of the poem is a, a Ballad of the Republic. I think that's another example of Thayer's uh, use of irony. Casey at the bat. <clears throat> the outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. So then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope that springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a Lulu, and the latter was a cake. <laughs> so upon that stricken multitude, Grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single, to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn a hugging third. Then from 5,000 throats or more, 
there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley. It rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. And there was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt it was Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. <laughs> then, while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered spear came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. <laughs> From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire, said someone in the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! <laughs> fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence, his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. <laughs> We have refreshments, a few. <laughs> Could I get David's friends to surround them so I can take one picture? And that means old and new friends. Everybody in here is a new friend. Could, could we do that? Where, where would you like us? Oh, there is fine. In front or in back? Yeah, sure, sure. That was awesome. Leslie, you can close that picture. Did you have to memorize them for the PhD? No, I just did it for the photo. You're welcome. I knew the Raven from school days. The rest I did uh, recently. Recently, you guys are almost within the last years? Mostly in the last It was fun. It was fun. Everybody should be in the picture. Yes, everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Adele should be in the picture too. Yeah, eventually. Yeah, eventually. Here we go. <laughs> Let's see. Uh oh. Here's just gonna have to get more intimate, everybody. Rows uh, together. There are a couple more rows to go back. I can't fit everyone in. Oh. I, I can't fit everyone in. But, you know that sometimes the kids could get on the floor in the front yeah, and kneel down like That's in the right. school you picture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Angela. Yeah. I'll be able to see them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not strangers. We're all very friendly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. No, we have to get Adele. Now. Yes, Adele. Adele. Come on, Adele. No, 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 no. I wanted the kids. You can take you can okay. take the code. Okay. No talking. KCS truck out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your finger is a little bit close to that. Oh. So one more <laughs> There's no joy in mud. <laughs> <laughs> there is 